Um, someone asks, what about the dogma of invincible ignorance? Does invin is invincible ignorance sacramental, Father? Even the new catechism delineates between invincible and invincible ignorance. So let's, you know, Pope Pius IX said, he actually used the, the boat analogy I just did, mm -hmm. um, that outside of this, this arc of the Catholic Church, no one can be saved. Um, those who through no fault of their own do not know of the Catholic Church are not therefore guilty in the eyes of the Lord. He means not as guilty. Now notice he didn't say are automatically saved. Exactly. He's talking about reduced culpability. This is Pope Pius IX. And the New Catechism, to its credit, uses very similar language. Those who through no fault of their own do not know the fullness of the Catholic faith. It's, it's a slightly different from Pope Pius IX in the 19th century. But even the New Catechism delineates between invincible ignorance and vincible ignorance. Okay, what's the difference between those two? Vincible ignorance means you had the internet at your fingertips. You could have Googled is this, 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 or mm -hmm. this a mortal sin. You could have Googled right. what the church has always taught, but you were too lazy to do it and you chose not to figure out the truth. Invincible ignorance means you're a pygmy born in Papua New Guinea and you never had a chance to meet a mission. Now that doesn't mean too many Catholics are like, well, therefore he's saved because he never met it. So it's like, wait a minute. So not meeting a missionary automatically makes your, no, that does not That's how not it works. Correct, That's yeah. not how it works. But you do have invincible ignorance if you never had a chance to learn the Catholic faith. It doesn't mean you're saved. It just is a little mark in the direction of reduced culpability. It's an yes. additional mark in the in the yeah. movement of, of, of. And so St. Thomas Aquinas actually talks about um, implicit and explicit desire for the faith. And, yes. and, and one of the, the two things, if I remember correctly, in the Summa is you, you have to have an, uh, a desire, an understanding of what's on the human heart, and belief in divine providence. And the second one's fascinating. Thomas Aquinas says, um, a belief in the need for a redeemer of mankind. Yes. I was thinking that's about like that. yeah. the bare minimum of, of implicit that's right. desire for baptism is what Thomas Aquinas calls it. And if you've never heard of baptism, how can you do it? Right. Why does he say that you know mankind needs a redeemer? I think it's because you have to be humble enough to know yours, even if you're a pygmy in Papua New Guinea. Yeah. You have to know somehow deep inside, even if you've never heard of the gospel, you're not cutting it on your own. Yeah, you, you need, need you need a redeemer. You need a, a, a priest. Yeah, sure. and, and when it comes to desire for baptism, Thomas Aquinas says explicit and implicit. And I think we should explain that to people because it'll yeah. help them. So explicit bap, uh, desire for baptism is you've been a catechumen. You know, maybe it's two weeks to Easter mm -hmm. and you're like, I just can't wait to get baptized. I've been loving these courses. You know, I've memorized the creed. I'm learning the Our Father and the Ten Commandments. And you're like, man, just two weeks to go. And then you get a heart attack. That's right. So this is a person who has explicitly stated to the church, the priest, his friends, his godfather, I want to be baptized and I can't wait for it to happen. And he dies ahead of time. So like St. Ambrose of Milan preached a sermon for such a catechumen saying he's going to make it. And you're not talking about the people who die of martyrdom before that, because that's baptism by blood. You're talking about yeah, non-martyrdom before. Just had a heart baptism. attack. Yep. You know, and so, but then Thomas Aquinas says, and this is, gets controversial. It's amazing that Thomas Aquinas in 1200s taught this because mm -hmm. he says there's implicit desire for baptism and that can be yes. different ranges. So let's say um, a Jesuit, arrives in Indonesia and he's preaching through the Apostles' Creed. It's week one and there's a woman there and she's like, this is amazing. You know, this makes so much more sense than my ancestral gods or whatever. And she's like, I, this is what I, I can't wait to learn more. I'm coming back tomorrow. And then she has a heart attack. Yeah. Right. So she's already consenting to there is one God, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin. He, she, they just, she hadn't got to one church won baptism for the remission of sins. Thomas Aquinas would say, since she was accepting the message of the missionary and mm. the gospel that she received, if it had been posed to her, and if you believe this, get this water ritual done to you called baptism for the remission of sins, she would have 100% gone with yep. it. So implicitly in her desire to serve Jesus was the fulfillment of that mandate. Okay. That's implicit. What gets crazy is, is before and after Vatican II, yeah. they begin to stretch that so far that it's a, were you nice to someone today? Exactly. Well, being nice to someone is being gracious and baptism gives you grace. And so that's an implicit desire exactly. for baptism. And so you've kind of lost all touch or all connection between hearing and receiving the gospel 
or even the bare minimum, like you said, mm -hmm. that God exists and there's a redeemer yeah. to positive sentimentality in a person. And it collapses grace on nature. Exactly. As soon as you're a good person, well, that is grace. And that, and that's what Rahner and these guys do is exactly. collapse grace on nature. Now, some people would listen to this and they would say, well, what's the point of pagans even living a good life if they're going to go to hell if they don't meet a missionary? Well, if you look at the history of Native American conversions, most tribes had very minimal conversions. But there's a tribe in northwest Montana. I think they were called the Flatheads. Yes, the Flatheads. Have you ever heard of them? Yes. They, were, they only had one wife. Um, they believed in only one God. Mm -hmm. They were actually following natural law decently well yes. before the Jesuits came in. So the Jesuits come in and they find... Okay, they're sinful people, but they're actually decently following natural law. One wife, only believe in one God. The conversion rate was, I think, over 90%. Yes. Because that's what's amazing. When you're actually living natural law, you do have this sense you need a redeemer even more. And so when the Jesuits yes. showed up, they actually wanted baptism. Yeah. I was talking about this the other night with my son Beckett, who you met yesterday. Uh, he was like, okay, so you get sanctifying grace when you're baptized mm -hmm. and... You know, if you have moral sin, confession, you get sanctifying grace, you increase it the same. But what about before you're baptized? Is there no grace? And I was like, well, you don't have sanctifying grace in your soul, but you have what's called provenient grace. And provenient grace is not a habit of the soul, but it is it is God's activity on you yes. that's making you click on the internet and sit, learn about Catholicism yes. or go talk to a priest or call your Catholic friend or maybe pick up a Bible, like God is giving you provenient graces that are preparing you. Thomas calls it preambula fidei. Mm, the preamble to the, the faith. But preamble is in Latin, walking before. It's beautiful. So you have provenient grace and preambles of faith that is all God's preparation for this explosion of grace in your life through Amazing. baptism. And those flathead Indians, Native Americans, they the preambles of grace and the prevenient grace was strong with them so they were yes. they were corresponding with prevenient grace so when the missionaries came with baptism 90 percent. and we as catholics believe even if someone's not in sanctifying grace that's probably most of the world either original sin or mortal sin god is still giving actual graces not sanctifying grace unless you have baptism or perfect contrition or confession but actual graces are flowing into the lives of those not in sanctifying grace all the time. Yeah. Not, not saying it's something to be saved, but it's moving you towards salvation. That's what's so dangerous about rejecting those actual graces. If yes. you're not baptized or if you're in mortal sin is God is still drawing you to himself. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and that can be true of course of individuals, but it's also can be true, true of communities. Mm, never thought of it that way. Yeah. Like I think there are certain families who are not yet Catholic, but may be predisposed by provenient grace. They're moving there. Yeah. And then they become, you see that in the book of Acts. Mm-hmm. Good point. Yeah.